I'm here today with Mark Iaconelli, the author of a new book titled Between the Listening and the Telling, How Stories Can Save Us. Mark is a speaker, retreat leader, spiritual director, story catcher, and the author of five previous books. He's the founder and executive director of The Hearth, Real Stories by Regular Folks, a nonprofit that assists cities and service-based agencies in producing personal storytelling events designed to help communities and individuals deepen relationships and cultivate compassion. Mark was also the co-founder and program director for the Center for Engaged Compassion, where he helped develop a unique set of practices and training programs for assisting individuals, organizations, and communities in creating genuine peace, healing, and reconciliation that changed the word world for good. In 1996, Mark co-founded the Youth Ministry and Spirituality Project at San Francisco Theological Seminary, a project that sought to test the integration of contemplative practice and awareness within youth working programs. Interviews and profiles of Mark's work have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, ABC World News Tonight, New York Times Online, Washington Post Online, Christianity Magazine, and CBS Radio. He holds an MA from the Graduate Theological Union and Graduate Diploma of Art of Spiritual Direction from San Francisco Theological Seminary. You can learn all about Mark at markiaconelli.wordpress.com. So Mark, thanks so much for joining us. It's uh, really a pleasure to meet you and uh, congratulations on all this amazing work that you've done. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, it's a, it's a little bit. I wonder like, who is he talking about right now? <laughs> you know, I don't know, who was this guy who did all these things? Some of us ancient history to remember now, it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, to get started, what else would you like people to know about you than what I touched on? Well, uh, I guess a couple of most important things are I've been uh, with my wife since we were 18 and 17, and she has edited and helped craft everything I've ever written, including this book. She's wow. just a huge support to me, and, uh, and, I, and I love her so much, and we do a lot of this work together. And then I have three kids, two, two sons who are in their 20s, and a daughter who just graduated and so this is going to be a year of grief. She's going to, she's going off to college. She's running away to start her life and abandoning her parents. So we're, <laughs> those are the other things <clears throat> that are, take up most of my life. Good, good, good. So um, one thing we obviously have in common is that we both love launching new things. We talked about this a little bit before we got started yeah. here, but um, I, in the intro, I mentioned a couple of different things that you launched. I mean, can you talk a little bit about those organizations and how the launch process looked? Yeah. So, you know, so, so I grew up in the, in the church, mostly did church work. And my dad was, was a very popular uh, youth minister, youth worker, wrote a lot of books, had a publishing company, was a popular speaker in, in Christian culture um, in the eighties and nineties. And um, so I went into youth work, <clears throat> but I became really interested in, in the mystical element of Christianity and contemplative practice, meditation, silent solitude, and doing that with kids. That later uh, evolved into, into a national project. I wrote books about it, and we did a lot of training around that work. But what I learned in that <clears throat> from young people who want to be in the present moment and from uh, the contemplative tradition, which is about being in the present moment, is that it's very difficult for us to pay attention to our actual human experience. So we think about this time right now with Black Lives Matter, with the Me Too movement, um, you know, some of the pain around this, uh, what's going on with Roe v. Wade is that people aren't listening to the grassroots experience or the ground truth or what's actually happening to the people at the center of these experiences. And, and there's those involved in those situations are trying to tell their story and speak it out. So in all my work, I've been trying to pay attention to the actual experience of people, whether young people we're in the compassion work. We worked with people in prisons. We worked with people uh, in, in civil war settings in, in Zimbabwe. How do we uplift and amplify the people at the center of a situation so that they have the platform, the experience to, to speak their experience, to, to, to tell what's really happening? Hmm. And this story work is just a an extension of that kind of uh, process. Wow. Wow. Uh, so before we get into the new book, can you tell folks a little bit about some of the previous books you've read. Well, uh, yeah. So, so, so the first, uh, I don't remember how many books I have. I think the first four books were all about this contemplative practice and young people. So mm -hmm. contemplative youth ministry was how do we 
pay attention to religious experience and how do we allow and liberate young people and those who work with them to actually pay attention to their experience of God um, and not just sort of secondhand where they're sitting in a Sunday school room. And so, so I went and kind of went into studied Ignatius, Ignatian spirituality and, and uh, different forms of spiritual practices I did with young people. And so the first three or four books are, are really about that movement, providing practices, the kinds of settings, uh, my own experience with young people. Um, the Gift of Hard Things was based on my, came out of the work I did at the Center for Engaged Compassion, which I helped found with my colleagues, uh, Dr. Andrew Dreitzer and Dr. Frank Rogers. Frank Rogers is, is really the the guy who had the theories and the work around that. But uh, it's it's a storybook. It's a series of stories um, that I think evoke our compassion and then some practices that help us um, um, em embody and carry a sense of compassion towards ourselves and towards others, and particularly towards difficult others <laughs> that we have in our life. So so those those gift the gift of hard things is is really about the way in which um, we are confronted with ourselves and difficult parts of ourselves mm -hmm. and confronted by difficult others like we're living in in this time right now where we all mm -hmm. we all know who our enemies are and where the dividing lines are. We're very clear about that right now. But how do we m move into those spaces with a greater sense of empathy? Hmm. Hmm. So um, let's get to the new book. As I mentioned, um, the title of it is Between the Listening and the Telling, How Stories Can Save Us. So what motivated you to write that book? Well, the other thing I should say is all my books come out of a life. So some people, you know, they, they have a brilliant idea and then they write a book about those ideas. All of my books uh, come out or kind of come at the end of a process. Like I've spent, hmm. so, so I've, this book comes out of a life. I've spent 12 years working in communities with story in a variety of ways. Um, I've worked with communities who are in trauma, where there's been a massive school shooting and using story to help bring about healing. I've used um, story around mobilizing around social action. So I worked with undocumented um, residents of Austin, Texas, right after Trump was elected. And we found a way to amplify those voices and to try to increase awareness of, of those folks. And I've worked with story just sort of celebrating and strengthening relationships in towns where you have a night where six local residents will get up and tell us, uh, uh, might be tales of childhood would be the theme or, or wonder. And, and local folks will get up and tell stories. We'll have music and, um, and that'll be a night just to try to build community. So after doing this work for 12 years, I realized um, there's something here, something powerful and accessible and democratic that I could express in this book, you know? So uh, so this book comes from that that life. And what I what the title, I, you know, I, I had some people go, this title is kind of laborious, but you know, <laughs> between the listening and the telling. But I realized there's so many projects about story right now. And, you know, there's there's master's degrees you can get at Stanford, at Harvard in the art of storytelling, which is really marketing is what they're talking about. And story, <laughs> story is branding. And, you know, and and there's lots of projects about how to really get that story right, how to get the arc right, you know, punch that ending, all that kind of stuff. What I recognize is, okay, that's one way to work with story. But the real power of story is the way in which when I, the way I'm trying to tell you what it feels like to be me. And so when I tell a story of the difficulty I, I went through when my daughter was ill, I'm trying to help you see step into my body and see what I see and hear what I hear and feel what I felt going through that illness. And so that we're sharing this human experience. And that's what's, that's the power of story is the way I invite you to live with me for a little bit or try to feel what I'm feeling. And that's what happens between us. And it takes you being willing to listen and openly and, and allow yourself to kind of move into my body and into my experience and it takes me being willing to tell you the truth of what i've lived and suffered and in the in-between space there's a kind of magic and that's what i'm trying to talk about and that magic i think can can give us the energy and uh, the inspiration to dismantle the dividing lines that, that live between us
is it empathy? Is what is that what it kind of boils down to? Is creation of empathy? It is. Uh, yeah, yeah. I think I think it's it's how empathy happens. You know, if 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 you and I talk about the immigration debate, you know, should we build a wall or not build a wall? How many people should be let in? All that kind of stuff. We're going to go into the same. We already have our arguments in our head, and I'm going to say something, and you go, okay. Well, when he says that, I say this. <laughs> you know, and what's and we're not going to change each other's mind, really. But if I brought in some families to tell you their experience of why they came across the border and how much they loved their country and didn't want to leave, but they had to because it was hard to feed themselves each day, or there was civil war, or there were drug cartels in their town, or some of the stories I've heard from people. Mm -hmm. um, and if you just listen to their experience, you wouldn't argue with it, right? Because you would just say, okay, here's this person. And I can tell they're just telling me what they went through. So you're going to be a little less defended than you are if we had an immigration debate. And you're just going to listen to that story. And as you kind of live through that experience, you might uh, say, huh, that moved me at a, at a, at a heart level. <clears throat> and the structures I have in my mind need to shift a little bit to encapsulate what I've just heard from this person. <laughs> so that's that's um, so it's not only. I mean, it's empathy, but um, story has the power to actually move us. So it's an emotional communication. And so it not only do I sit there going like, wow, that that's that's really hard. I'm sorry you went through that. I might actually, if, particularly if it's in person, I think, say, I'm going to vote differently. How do I support you? You know, hey, what do you need from me? I, those things can happen. Story can actually move us to act. So it's I, I would call it. Uh, compassion in that way. Like our gut is moved and we have to act. Mm -hmm. It has that power anyways. So who would you say the book is intended for? Well, you know, and of course, when you work with publishers, that's what they, they keep trying to get yep. you to name it. Yep. <laughs> well, you know, I would have, I would have said this, I think when I wrote it that I was writing for what I would call a uh, community builders. So there are those people who are tasked either in their jobs or just in their calling from who they are to try to connect us and build community. So those can be sometimes teachers, nonprofit leaders and pastors, faith leaders, um, parents who are, you know, volunteer organizations, that kind of stuff. But the book's been out. I mean, it, it, the release date is next week, but Amazon sent it out early to people and yeah. the feedback I'm getting. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. You have the early version. I have an advanced reader copy. <laughs> yeah. The advanced reader copy, but, but um but I probably had, I don't know, 20 or 30 people write me about it. And uh, I think it's for everybody. I think mm. it, the very first part of the book, I'm, I'm trying to talk about that feeling that we all have where it's like, I'm not really in my life. I'm not really here. I'm just playing a role. I'm lost in a series of tasks. I have a to-do list or I have a set of expectations on me. And this isn't the person I want to be. And story is really the language of experience so that when you go into any healing setting, whether it's therapy or group work or AA, they're going to invite you to tell your story. And in telling your story, it's not just about solving a problem. It's about coming home to yourself. And so I think this book resonates deeply with people, uh, any human being right now who just feels a little bit lost <laughs> and and not living the life we had hoped when we were young. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. So in my work with How to Heal Our Divides, I hear a lot of people talking about the use of story. Um, mm -hmm. And that can be instrumental in dealing with, you know, some of the serious divides that we have. You mentioned immigration, you know, there's racial, political, right. gender, all kinds of serious divides. Have you seen the story aspect actually work in a, um, I would say, methodical, scalable, kind of way to help deal with some of these issues? Um, I mean, I, I definitely have seen it work. Um, and, and I and I definitely have a systemic, you know, process that I use when I when I work with groups. Most of, you know, most of the 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 process you need is to make sure <laughs> that you create an environment where people will listen. Mm -hmm. That's why it's called between the listening. That's why I put listening first. Listening is the most important thing. If nobody's listening, then the story dies and, or people don't share. Or there's no vulnerability. So so having strong rules that 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 allow 
folks to, you know, simple things like when you have people in groups, it's like, okay, one person's going to share their experience. Uh, everyone else in the group is not allowed to comment or to ask questions, you know, uh, rules like that help. But let me tell you a story. I had a group of uh, veterans come to me and say, at a, um, hey, we want to tell our stories. We're combat veterans. And they said, you know, here's, here's the truth. Nobody wants to hear our story. You know why they you know why they say veterans can you know or military folks can go on the plane first is because nobody wants to be with us. You go on first. You know why people say thank you for your service? It's another way of saying shut up. Hmm. I don't want to hear like thank you for your service and that's enough from you. Hmm. Uh, this this is with this particular group. Wow. You know, not with everyone, but but they felt a, felt a sense of I don't really want to know what you did and what you experienced over there. I'm afraid of it. So can we have a night where we tell our stories? Hmm. Okay, so I put it together. We typically have about 400 people who gather when I do storytelling wow. events. And the veterans told me, you won't get, you'll be lucky to get half of that. And I said, no, 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 we have a really devoted audience. And they were right. About only 200 came out to hear oh. them. Majority of people didn't come. And the veterans were telling me they don't want to know these stories. Well, that night, we had a lot of red hats in the room. You know, a lot of MAGA hats, a lot of uh, veterans there pro-military folks, they want to hear these stuff. And these good people. And they heard the, the stories, but I had one storyteller, young man, probably, well, young to me, 35 years old. Um, and as you know, in America, you can be undocumented and you can still sign up for the military and go fight for this country. And often we promise these people they'll get citizenship. This guy had gone, he'd done two tours, he fought in the Marines, he told his story at this event. And he just mentioned at the end, I'm undocumented. Uh, I was told I would get citizenship if I served and did two tours. I did my two tours. I still don't have citizenship. Hmm. Now, when he finished his story and the evening ended, I watched all these guys with their MAGA hats go over and talk to him hmm. and say, we got to make this right. Like, what do you mean you don't have citizenship? What do you need? How do we get a lawyer? How do we make this happen? Hmm. Now, if I had talked to those guys about immigration, they might have been on the other side of it. But in hearing this story and being moved by his experience, they were like, you know, not on our watch. We're gonna, you know, we gotta help you, and and move the, it moves the needle just a little bit. That's the power of story, I think, to bridge divisions. Wow, very cool, very cool. So, um, <clears throat> Anne Lamott wrote the forward to your book, right. which right. to me is a big deal. Um, <laughs> I, I actually worked with her on a book about Frederick Buechner where she wrote the introduction to that too. So I know what it's like, you know, to have someone like that. Uh, and and you survived it. You say, you know what it's like. You, you, she didn't beat you up. She, <laughs> she's brutally honest, that woman. Oh, she is. But I mean, <laughs> I'm okay with that. I mean, yeah. I don't have any problem with that whatsoever. I mean, it, we, we actually yeah. worked really well to put this whole book together together. Right. So, yeah. but anyway, um, how did that happen for you? How did, how did you get Anne Lamott to write an introduction for you? Well, I mean, I mean, the, the real story is we lived in the same area. I was at San Francisco Theological Seminary, which is about five miles from where she lives. And um, um, I was doing Sundays. I was teaching a Sunday school class and her son was in the class. Oh, wow. So, so Sam Lamott was in the class. Yeah. And often it was just Sam and me, <laughs> just me, the two of us. And so I got to know her a little bit through that work. And then she, you know, she, she's not posturing in her book. She talks a lot about working in Sunday school classes, serving at the church. She is a devoted church person. I mean, she's there every Sunday. She ran and she ran the uh, Christian education. She was in charge of all the children for years, for years. I think she still might be, uh, maybe three decades <laughs> of running that committee. So she would have me come in to do trainings for the teachers there. Uh, trainings for the the youth workers there, and so we got to know each other through mm -hmm. through that work, and we we just became friends, and um, and you know I mean I, I like you said I've written six books, and she would you know nicely look at some of the books I've written, <laughs> but this this one she she asked me in fact she's one of the reasons I wrote this book about three years ago she said do you have any writing that you're hanging on to and I said yeah and I sent her these chapters that I had just been musing about. And she said, you're on to it. This, this is exactly the book that we need right now. Wow. And so she said, I want to help edit this book. So she actually, I sent her, wow. I was, my wife would edit the chapters. Then we sent it to Anne uh, and Annie would, would work with them. So she worked on, her hand is in every single chapter. Wow. And she's really gotten behind this book. 
she helped find the agent. She helped, you know, she's helped at every stage of this book and she believes in it and she's been a real champion. That is so fantastic. That yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. She's all, she's also the kind of person who writes me notes like, um, Hey, I slept through the first four pages of this, of the manuscript. <laughs> you know, did, did I miss anything? Let me know if I met, you know, stuff like that. Or did you write this paragraph or the democratic national committee? <laughs> so oh, that's all classic. Uh, Anne Lamott, isn't it? Pretty hard. Yeah. Oh, but she's great. I mean, you know. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it's also for Broadleaf Books, too, which I really have a lot of respect for what they've been doing recently. Yeah, right, right. They're trying to, to bridge this sort of spiritual secular divide that we've had. Yeah. Yes, yes, absolutely. So what would you want readers to most take away from the book? Well, hopefully a deep breath. That's one of the things. You know, the thing about story that I love is that we're all hardwired for story. And so, um, so all of us can practice communicating with one another in a deeper and more real way. We can move out of the ways the social media is forming us in these sort of um, highly charged, angry, you know, sound bites, and we can have a deeper human experience of ourselves and of other people. And story talk, sitting around a dinner table, taking your time enjoying the food, having the spoons set aside, and just talking about what we're living through. It used to be something we experienced throughout our day, you know. Now it's rare. Mm -hmm. And I want to bring us back to something that we we all know but have forgotten, that, uh, that we belong to one another and that we need one another uh, if we're going to find our way home. And I think this book can invite you into those spaces where where you don't feel you have one more thing you have to do. Instead, you just go... Oh yeah, I forgot. I forgot. I I I don't want to be the way I've been in the world. There's another way I want to be, and I know that way. It's a remembering, you know. I know how to savor my experience. I know how to listen. I know how to tell the truth about what I'm experiencing. I can do those things, and I I want to do those things. So that's what I hope for. Very cool. Yeah. So I know you're right in the middle of launching this book, but um, is there anything in terms of future projects, whether a book project or otherwise that you can talk about? Well, I mean, yes, we're in the middle of, we're going to do this year, year and a half long tour. And and the wow. hope is, is that in these settings that if I do my job right, create um, rooms where people can experience the book. So you might actually come experience some of these things and think that's all I needed and not buy the book. That's fine. <laughs> you know, it's just, I, I want to, so I'm, I'm doing things with families and at universities and uh, churches and bookstores and, wow. and some community events where people can um, experience what it's like to interact in a different way than we find ourselves in today. And that, that's really my big hope for this next year and a half of that project. I mean, I do trainings in this work. And so I'm hoping to attract more people to those, trainings so they can spread it out into healthcare or environmental work or in schools, which I, I have people doing right now. Um, there's something missing in how we're interacting with one another. And I think those trainings help bring it back to the surface. Hmm. Wow. Very cool. I hope that goes yeah. really well for her. Yeah, me too. <laughs> <laughs> so again, the title of the new book is Between the Listening and the Telling, How Stories Can Save Us. And you can learn more about Mark and all of his work at markyacinelli.wordpress.com. So, Mark, thanks so much uh, for joining yeah. us and for doing this incredible work. Really uh, appreciate and respect it. I appreciate the time. Thank you, Brian.